As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm so glad you've joined me for the program today. And I'm believing that you're going to really get something brand new from the Word of God as we study Revelation chapter 1. We're looking at John's vision of the exalted Christ in Revelation chapter 1. But today, very quickly, I want us to review one key word in verse 1. This is very foundational to the whole chapter. When you come to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the verse begins by saying, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what we have in Revelation chapter 1. We have a revelation of of Jesus Christ. As we saw in the last program, this word revelation is a Greek word, apokalupsis. And very quickly, I want to cover it again because it is so vital to this text. The word apokalupsis, here translated revelation, is a compound of two Greek words. The word kalupsis, which means to cover something or to veil something. Really, it's the word for a curtain, just like the curtain that you would have on the window of your house. And of course, when the curtain is closed, you can't see what's on the other side. In order to see what's on the other side, you have to open the curtain. Well, the word revelation really describes the opening of a veil or the opening of a curtain. The word calypsis, which describes a curtain or a veil, connected to the word apo. The word apo means a way. Compound the two words together. It means to remove the veil, to remove the curtain. I say it's like looking out the window of your house. If you look out the window of your house, there's so much for you to see. However, if the curtains are closed, you cannot see what is there. What's beyond the curtains is there all the while, but you're unable to see it and enjoy it because the curtains are closed. But when the curtains begin to open and when they're fully open, then you're able to fully appreciate and see what's been there all along. That's a revelation. And that's what the word apocalypsis translated revelation means. So when Revelation 1, 1 talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ, it tells us that supernaturally the veil has been removed. God by his spirit has pulled the curtain apart and has allowed us to see Jesus as previously no one had ever seen him. And it's the apostle John who's writing these words. And that's very important because John had very vivid memories of Jesus. In fact, when you read 1 John chapter 1, John talks about his memories of Jesus with great fondness. He says that which we handled, that which we saw, that which we touched. He speaks of Jesus with great fondness. He carries the memories of Jesus in his heart. He can still hear the sound of Jesus' voice. John remembers Jesus. But in Revelation chapter 1, he sees Jesus as he has never seen him before. This view of Christ was obstructed from his view until the Holy Spirit pulled the veil apart. And when the Holy Spirit pulled the veil apart, John saw Christ in his exalted state. Christ had always been like this, but John had been unable to see it until he had a revelation. So that's what the word revelation means. And the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the primary revelation in the book of Revelation. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, we saw the very end of the verse ends with the name John. John identifies himself as the author of this book. Then when you come to verse 4, it begins again with the word John. It says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So a second time in four verses, he identifies himself as John. It's very important. Then when you come to verse 9, he does it again. In verse 9, he says, I, John. And in Greek, it is the word ego for I. This word ego draws attention to himself. He is emphatically declaring, in case you wonder who it is speaking with you, let me affirm who it is. This is John talking to you. And this was very important at that moment because the church was suffering for their faith. And in fact, all of the other apostles of Jesus had already been martyred for their faith. They were all gone. And John was the only surviving voice left of the first 12 apostles. And the church was suffering because Domitian was now the emperor of the Roman Empire. 
And Domitian had declared himself to be Lord and God and was requiring everyone in all places of the Roman Empire to worship him and to burn incense to his image. And believers refused to do that. And because of that, they were suffering. John himself has been suffering. He's been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where as a political prisoner, he is suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while he's been on the Isle of Patmos for 18 months, his voice has been silent. The church has not heard from him, but they need to hear from their general in the faith. So finally, when John writes to them, he says in verse 9, I, John, it's me. It's really me. This is the voice you're needing to hear from. And now I have something to say to you. This is me. I, John. And certainly the readers must have stood up straight when they heard John was writing to them. And notice how John identifies himself in verse 9. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In verse 9, John identifies himself in several important ways. First of all, he says, I am also your brother. John really could have said, I, John, the illustrious disciple of Jesus. I, John, the last surviving apostle. John could have really leveraged who he was. However, at this moment, John is writing to people that are suffering. And John comes right down to their level. Rather than boast of how great he is, he says, I am also your brother. He comes right down to their level. And really, this is a mark of real spirituality and maturity. When you're really mature, you don't have to prove how great you are. When you're really mature, you can come down to the level of the people to whom you're trying to reach. This is what God did in the incarnation. God came down to earth and became as a man. This is a mark of spiritual maturity. And now we find John not boasting of how great he is, but he says, I, John, who also am your brother. This word brother is the Greek word adelphos, which really is a medical term. The word delphos describes the womb of a woman. But when it becomes the word adelphos, it means one born out of the same womb. And John, by using this word adelphos, here translated brother, is saying to his readers, you and me, we're out of the same womb. We have the same emotions. We face the same problems. We feel the same things. We're born out of the same womb of humanity. But not only that, he was saying, you and me, we're both born out of the womb of God. They're united in Christ. But there's something even more important than that. This word brother, as it is used in the popular sense in the New Testament, what do I mean? In the New Testament, they greet each other as brethren, brothers. Well, that was not always the case. Again, this was primarily, originally, a medical term. This word, adelphos, the word brother, was not popularized the way we find it in the New Testament until the time of Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was the greatest soldier that had ever lived up until his time. He was adored by other soldiers. And because he was so adored from time to time, he would have huge award ceremonies where he would bring together many, many adoring soldiers. And when he knew of one soldier that was especially brave, a soldier that had really paid the price and had gone the extra mile, he would call that soldier by name and would summon them onto the stage. They would stand next to him. He would wrap his arm around them, embrace them, and would say to all the other watching soldiers, let all the empire know that Alexander is proud to be the brother of this soldier. And by calling him a brother, he was saying, he and I, we're the same. We're out of the same womb. We feel the same thing. We face the same battles. We have the same victors. But in addition to that, it became a military word, which really carried the idea of a comrade. He and I are comrades. And that is the way the word brother is used in the New Testament. When the saints greet each other and call each other brethren, they're not just calling each other brethren. They're really referring to each other in a militaristic way that they are comrades. Now John is writing to his readers that are suffering. They may feel like they're failing because they're having struggles. But John says to them, I'm proud to be your brother. As long as you're in the fight, as long as you're still slugging it out, 
As long as you're still going for the victory, I want you to know I'm proud to be associated with people like you. You're not just my brethren, but you're also my comrades in the Lord. This must have been a great boost to those that were reading this epistle. But then John goes on and he says, I, John, who also am your brother, now you understand it has a militaristic meaning, who also am your fellow comrade. You and me, we're in this together. He said, and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He uses the word companion. The word companion is a Greek word koinonia, which means to share something in common or to have a common experience. But when you connect it to the word soon, it means two of us joint partners. We have a joint experience. It was the equivalent of saying what you are experiencing is not unique. I also have experienced it. And of course, John was on the Isle of Patmos suffering for his faith, exiled there because of the Emperor Domitian. Believers everywhere are suffering because of the Emperor Domitian. And now John says, hey, it's not just you, me too. I'm in the same condition that you are in. So first of all, he says we're brethren, the equivalent of saying we're comrades in the faith. Secondly, he says, don't feel that your situation is so unique. We're all going through the same thing. In fact, I am your companion. And again, he's coming right down to the level of his readers so he can connect with them. But then he continues to say, I'm your companion in tribulation. This word tribulation is the Greek word thalipsis. The word thalipsis is a word most often used in the epistles of Paul. The word thalipsis describes a heavy pressure situation. Someone who feels pinned against the wall, a crushing situation, you would say is debilitating. And in fact, this word thalipsis means to be nearly suffocated. The Apostle Paul uses this word very clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 when he says we were under great pressure. That's the word thalipsis. And now John uses this word to describe what he himself has experienced in his walk of faith. It hasn't all been a bed of roses. He's come up against many things as he's tried to walk out his walk of faith. Great persecution has come against him. And in fact, he calls it tribulation, the Greek word thalipsis. It is the equivalent of saying what I have been through has been devastating. It's been crushing. There were times when I felt suffocated as if I didn't even know if I was going going to be able to breathe my next breath. Well, John is not saying these things just to talk about how difficult it's been. He's connecting with his readers as a pastor. He's speaking to his flock who also is going through a very rough time because of persecution at the hands of the emperor Domitian. But then John goes on to say why he's suffering these things. He said, companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. John never lost sight of the reason for why he was suffering. It wasn't just because of him. It was because of the kingdom. This word kingdom, the Greek word basileia, it describes the rule of God. We see here that John remembered all of this was because he had taken a stand for the kingdom of God. And likewise, when difficulties come against you, don't always personalize it. Remember, you are are advancing the kingdom of God and the enemy is against the kingdom. It's not so much you as it is for what you stands. And John said, I stand for the kingdom. And because I stand for the kingdom, I'm also experiencing the patience of Jesus Christ. The word patience is the Greek word hupomene from the word hupo, which means to be under as to be under a very heavy load. And the word meno, which means I abide or I stay. When you compound the two words together, it forms the Greek word hupomene, which the King James Version translates as the word patience. It's really not a very good translation. This word hupomene, hupo to be under, meno to stay, when compounded together, is really the picture of endurance. It's the picture of one who meno is in his spot, hupo, he's under a very heavy load, but he's decided that he's not going to budge, flinch. He's not moving for any reason. He refuses to surrender his territory. This is his spot. He will not relinquish it to anyone else. This was the equivalent of John saying, it doesn't matter what life does, what the emperor does, or what any form of persecution attempts to do. I've made my mind up. I'm not surrendering. I'm not moving. I'm not budging in my commitment 
to Jesus Christ. So already in this verse, we've seen a lot. First of all, we find out that it's John who is speaking. Secondly, we find that he is a comrade. He's a fellow fighter with other fighters. Next, he says, I'm a companion. What you're experiencing is not unique. I'm in the same boat that you're in. He says, I'm a companion in tribulation. The word tribulation, again, the word thalipsis, a very heavy pressure situation, nearly suffocating, pinned against the wall, never been in such a crushing situation. John's describing his own ordeal on the island of Patmos where he is suffering. Then he says, I'm doing this because of the Basileia, because of the kingdom. It's because of the kingdom that I'm going through all this. It's really not about me. It's about the kingdom for which I stand. However, he says, I'm standing in the patience of Jesus Christ. Hupomene, I've made my decision. I'm not budging. I'm not flinching. I'm not moving. It doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do. I've already made up my mind. I'm not moving. Wow. In this verse, we never see a hint of surrender. There's no surrender here. John's moving in faith. John is committed. Just as he said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, we have a faith that overcomes the world. And John was standing in that faith, believing that it would overcome his circumstances. And eventually, John overcame. His faith overrode the system. It enabled him to survive his ordeal. And likewise, if you'll be committed, if you'll make the decision that you're not budging, you're not flinching, you will survive. And not just survive, you will overcome. That is the promise of Scripture. And never think that you're in this by yourself. There are other people suffering just like you, other people having to take a stand of faith, dealing with difficult issues. They are your comrades. And you are a companion with them. And together, you're going for the kingdom of God and the rule of the kingdom in your life and in every part of your life. But yet John says, I was in the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. When he says, I was, this word was is the Greek word genomai. And the word genomai always describes something that takes you off guard or by surprise. Something that takes you off guard or by surprise. And in this verse, it's the equivalent of saying, through a strange set of circumstances that I don't know how they happened, I don't even know how they could ever be repeated, I somehow came to Genomai, find myself in the Isle of Patmos. This was not something John would have ever predicted. But through a strange set of circumstances, Genomai, he came to find himself strangely in the Isle of Patmos. And the last program, we looked at the Isle of Patmos. Patmos was a repository for criminals, two kinds of criminals, common criminals and political criminals. John was a political criminal because he would not burn incense to the image of the emperor Domitian. Therefore, he was exiled for breaking the law. He was considered to be a political criminal. And John has come to find himself on the Isle of Patmos of all places in the middle of the sea. And John says, I know why I'm here. I'm here because of, he says in verse 9, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why he's there. And by the way, when you're going through a difficult time, it's important for you to remember why. It's because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It's not all about you. The devil's after the word. The devil's after your testimony. John didn't give up, and you shouldn't give up either. Take your stand. Decide you're not budging. You're not flinching. You're not relinquishing your territory. You stand fast, just like John says he did in verse 9. But then listen to what John says in verse 10. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now John tells us how he received the book of Revelation. And the first thing he tells us in verse 10 is, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The word was is again this Greek word genomai, which takes something off guard, you off guard or by surprise, which means John did not anticipate this was going to happen on this day. It took him completely off guard and by surprise. A great example of this word genomai is in Acts chapter 10, verse 10. And in Acts 10, verse 10, the Bible describes Peter on the rooftop. 
And the Bible says he's on the rooftop waiting for lunch. And while he's waiting for lunch, Acts 10, 10 says exactly he fell into a trance. Fell into is the same word, the word genomai, which means Peter on the rooftop was not anticipating that he was going to fall into a trance. He was waiting on lunch. He was just waiting on lunch. And while he was sitting on the roof time, get on my, he fell into, took him completely off guard, took him completely by surprise. Peter found himself in another dimension, in a trance where he had a vision. So this word get on my there very clearly shows how it's something that takes you off guard or by surprise. Now in Revelation chapter one and verse 10, Peter uses, uh, John uses the same word. And John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Get on my, I don't know how it happened. It was the last thing I would have anticipated that day. I did not think this was going to happen, but in some way, which I cannot explain, get on my, I came to find myself in the spirit. The word spirit in the King James version is capitalized. However, there is no capital for the word spirit in Greek. In Greek, this is a lowercase s. It just says, I came to find myself in spirit. John is describing a spiritual dimension. It really means, I don't know how. I could have never anticipated it. It completely took me off guard and by surprise, but I found myself in a spiritual dimension. He says, on the Lord's day. Lord's day does not refer to Saturday. It's not the Sabbath. And it does not refer to Sunday, which is the Christian day of worship. It is the Greek word kuriakos. And the word kuriakos was a technical term used by the emperor, coined by Domitian, to describe a day of the month in which Domitian required all citizens in the Roman Empire to set aside their time, specifically, concretely, to worship him. And so now John tells us kuriakos, on this day when the rest of the empire was worshiping, demented, depraved Domitian. On that day when the lost world was worshiping a fallen, depraved leader. On that very day, I came to find myself in another dimension. And while the world was worshiping a false commander, the real commander stepped into the cave where John was residing and revealed himself to John in a brand new way. On that very day, Jesus revealed himself to John in his glorified state. And listen to what he says. I was in the spirit, or now we see the Greek word genomai. I came to find myself in the spirit, lowercase s, in a spiritual dimension. I came to find myself in the spirit realm. He said, on the Lord's day, Kuriakas, on the day when everyone else was worshiping the emperor, I came to find myself in the spirit and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia. And then he identifies the seven churches unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. But notice how Jesus begins in verse 11. He says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Well, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. But when you find this formula, Alpha and Omega, is the equivalent of saying, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, and I'm everything in between. It is the equivalent of saying, I'm all that there is. I'm Alpha. I'm Omega. I'm the first. I'm the last. I'm everything in between. I am all sufficient to meet your needs. And then Jesus begins to address the seven churches, which are in Asia. And these were churches that John was the bishop over. And this is where we're going to begin when we come back in the next program. But wow, there's so much in verse 9. So now John lets us know he's their brother, he's their comrade, he's their companion. He's also suffering tribulation. But he knows it's because of the kingdom. And he's made the decision that he's going to be patient. He's going to operate in endurance. He's not going to budge. And because of his commitment, he's being attacked. But in the midst of this deep, dark place where John was, John suddenly found himself in the spirit realm and Jesus revealed himself 
as the real commander. While the world was worshiping a false general, a false king, the real king stepped into that place where John was. And likewise, when you find yourself in a deep, dark hole emotionally or in some other area of your life, that is the moment when Jesus wants to surprise you. He wants to make a surprise appearance and reveal himself to you in a new way. If you need to know Christ the healer, he will reveal himself to you as the healer. If you need to know Christ the deliverer, he will reveal himself to you as the deliverer. If you need to know his ability to prosper, he will reveal, reveal himself to you as the one who prospers. Jesus will reveal himself to you where you are as you need. And that's what we find in Revelation chapter 1. But we're out of time. This program has been packed I pray you've gotten something from it today. But if you have a prayer need, please use the information that is on the screen right now to contact us. We are people of prayer. And when we tell you that we'll pray for you, we sincerely mean we will pray for you as soon as we hear from you. But in closing, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let the word of God release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. In John's vision of the exalted Christ, Rick shares the riveting account of the exalted Christ appearing in a vision to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos to deliver his ageless messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Walk through several verses of the first chapter of Revelation as well as pages of church history as we explore many untold details of the last living original apostle, the Apostle John. This captivating five-part series includes John's exile on the Isle of Patmos, how John identified himself to believers as their companion in suffering, how supernatural occurrences take place, Christ's eternal positioning, and why he likens the church to candlesticks, what the exalted Christ revealed to the Apostle John about the condition of the seven churches, a message that applies to the church today. This eye-opening series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. We're also offering Rick's book, A Light in Darkness. Discover the world of the first century church in this richly detailed historical narrative, enhanced by classic artwork and beautiful photograph shot on location at archaeological sites. Survey the culture, people, and practices surrounding early believers in the cities of Ephesus and Smyrna. This book will make the lands and the message of the Bible come alive to you as never before. This beautifully bound, 800-page, full-color biblical resource can be yours for $80. Don't miss these special offers, this series, John's Vision of the Exalted Christ, and the book, A Light in Darkness. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Now. Friends, this is Rick Renner. Now, right now, I'm in the interior of the Moscow Good News Church. It is quite an amazing place. When you walk through this building, it's so beautiful and it testifies to the grace of God and the provision of God and the giving of our church and of our partners. We built this facility debt free, and because of that, the Moscow Church has never had the burden of monthly payments. All of our funds have been released to do the work of the gospel. And now we need to do that in Tulsa, and I call this Phase 3. And I'm asking you today to pray about joining us as part of the giving team for Phase 3, which is paying off the Tulsa facility. And the reason we want to pay it off is because then it will release funds for us to take the teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth. And dear friend, right now, the Bible is so needed. And I know that that's my heart and that is your heart. And together, we can take the Bible to the ends of the earth. So please pray about joining us for phase three to finish paying off the Tulsa building. And I want to say thank you in advance. If you enjoyed this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.